Hello, Chem 30 students. So today we're looking at applications of electrolytic cells. Um, so in the last lesson, we went over, you know, the basics of electrolytic cells. And so now we're going to look at some applications of that because the common question is, why do we want um, to have a cell where we need to power the reaction that's happening? So some of the curricular outcomes, just making sure that you can essentially describe some of the science and technology applications that have developed and so that's mostly what we'll be looking at today um yeah and that's pretty much the main thing that you need to be aware of that that you can be questioned on in tests um <clears throat> So electrolytic cells are useful for a bunch of different things that we'll look at today. One of them is rechargeable batteries. So remember we talked about um, those types of cells where, yes, you have a spontaneous redox reaction in the forward reaction, which is, you know, standard for like a voltaic cell. But in order to recharge the battery, we need to force the chemical reaction to happen using electricity. That's when you plug in your rechargeable batteries. And so that's um, looking at it more like an electrolytic cell, right? Another thing is that it can be used for is refining. So using it to purify a material when you're looking for one specific um, element, for example. So in this case, the anode is made out of an impure metal, such as copper ore. So this is, you know, when they're doing mining, this is what they would actually pull out of the earth. They don't pull out pure copper. Um, and then the cathode is made out of the pure metal. So for example, copper in this case. And so um, basically what happens during electrolysis is that the impure anode dissolves. Remember, we've seen that happening lots where we see the anode kind of being eaten away. And then we have that a buildup on the cathode, um, which is where pure copper is plated. And so that allows us to have um, a mostly pure version of the metal and which is what we're looking for. And then the impurities that were found in the copper ore that were made out of the anode are basically going to either stay in solution or they might precipitate out depending on what they are, but they essentially are left in a way that, you know, they can be filtered away so that we're only left with the pure material um, on the cathode. <clears throat> Let's see, what else do we have here? So if we want to coat something with a, with a layer of a specific material, it's called electroplating. Electroplating. And so basically this is where we have a thin layer of a desired metal that's used to coat um, or plate another object. So this is often used to protect objects against corrosion. So the metal that we can be using to coat might be less likely to be oxidized and so it can pr um, protect whatever you've coated it with. Um, the other thing it can be done is it's used to improve appearance so lots of times if you buy jewelry if you don't want to spend money to have like pure gold for example then you can have um, something that's gold plated so you still get that appearance of gold but it's at a reduced cost because you don't have to pay for solid gold the whole way through so there will be another metal underneath and then um, <coughs> gold will just be coated over the surface um, in this example, we actually have jewelry being electroplated with silver, which is another substance that can be used. Um, so an inexpensive metal makes the jewelry and then a thin layer of silver is applied to improve the appearance. So for this to work, the object that's being plated must be the cathode, right? Because that's where we always see that depositing of a solid. And the anode has to be the metal that you want to coat with so that the ions from the anode can move into solution and be used to um, plate the object. So in this example here, they're trying to plate um, a spoon and the spoon is made out of iron. And so, um, over here on the anode, we want to silver plate this spoon. So we have the anode made out of silver. So at the anode, we're going to have the oxidation reaction happening where solid silver becomes silver ions. And then um, at the cathode here, we're going to have the exact opposite happening where the silver ions come out of solution to form solid silver. Um, so basically oxidation and reduction in this case are the same reaction, but just in reverse, which is still okay because it's a non-spontaneous reaction, right? <clears throat> um, 
Another thing to be aware of is a lot of times if you're dealing with electroplating um, questions, you'll be asked to identify like what you could be using as an electrolyte in the solution. A lot of times the recommendation is whatever metal you're working with, just make it into a compound with nitrate because nitrate is like a non-reactive soluble substance um, or s soluble, I guess, ion in in a compound, I guess is what you would say, or it forms compounds that are that are soluble and non-reactive. There we go. That's the best way to say that. Um, so yeah, so a lot of times if you're asked to come up with an electrolyte solution, an appropriate solution for plating, um, just whatever metal you're working with, just combine it with nitrate in an ionic compound. Other applications, um, production of elements. So this is where instead of having a solution, you actually have molten ionic compounds that are going to form um, you know, the substance you're looking for at the cathode and nonmetals at the anode. So in this reaction, they want to form solid sodium. So if you have this, um, you know, vat of molten sodium chloride, so remember molten just means that it's in its liquid form, um, then basically what's going to happen is because it's in its liquid form, the ions are free to move. And so um, the sodium is going to move to the cathode where reduction can occur. And um, that means that we can have this formation of solid sodium. And in the meantime, the negative ions, the chlorine um, anions, are going to move to the anode. And that's going to form chlorine gas. Okay. <clears throat> Um, now, this is also one thing to be aware of here is that we use these molten compounds instead of aqueous to prevent metals from reacting with water um, because, as you hopefully remember, group 1 ions are highly reactive with water. Um, so we don't want that to be happening in this situation. So let's go through an example of um, kind of what you might need to know if you were looking at electroplating, what would, what would be going on there. So we have an iron bar is going to be electroplated with zinc. Draw and label a diagram of this electrochemical cell, and then it gives you a list of things to make sure you know. So identify what will act as electrodes. So first of all, just looking at the electron movement here, we have electrons moving to the left. Electrons always move from anode to cathode. So we know that over here we're going to have our anode, and over here we're going to have our cathode. Okay, um, so that's identifying the anode and, and cathode. Identify what will act as the electrodes. So in this case, we want an iron bar to be electroplated with zinc. So remember, the thing that we want to have coded is always the cathode. So our iron bar has to be the cathode. <clears throat> and then because we're trying to electroplate it with zinc, that means the zinc needs to come off of the anode, right? So we have to have a solid anode that's becoming aqueous ions that can be plated onto the cathode. And so basically that means the anode has to be solid zinc. Okay, so we've identified those. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is write um, the half reactions that are happening. So at the cathode, we want to see that zinc being plated on, which means basically we need to see zinc becoming solid on this side. And so if we look at our reaction with zinc here, we want to have solid zinc as our product, which means we're looking at our reduction reaction, which always happens at the cathode. So that makes sense. So this is going to be our half reaction at the cathode. And remember, at the anode, we need to have the production of the ions that will be used for that reduction at the cathode. So at the anode, we have the exact opposite. We have the oxidation half reaction. So we have solid zinc um, forming zinc 2 plus ions and the electrons that we see moving up here. Um, and so that's our half reactions. Identify an appropriate electrolytic solution. So like I mentioned on the previous slide, when you're coming up with the electrolytic solution, you want the material that you're using to electroplate, and you want it to be combined with an ion that's going to be soluble and non-reactive. So again, let's go for um, nitrate as that one. So that means we're going to have zinc with NO3 
and we're going to need two nitrates because zinc has that charge of plus two. Now in the electrolytic solution, what is that going to form? It's going to form zinc two plus ions and nitrate ions. Okay, so those are our products there. So that's our electrolytic solution. Identify which electrode will be attached to the negative post of the battery and which will be attached to the positive post. So just keep in mind here that we have a non-spontaneous reaction happening, right? We have a power source here to help that happen. So in that case, looking at any electrolytic cell, remember that means that, like for me personally, I always think about voltaic first and then I go from there. So I know that at a voltaic cell, I would think because the anode is being oxidized, um, that means electrons are being produced, which means that we have an accumulation of negative charge here. But with an electrolytic cell, because we have to force that, basically what we need to have is something that will pull the electrons from the anode for oxidation. And so that means we need to have the positive terminal at the side with the anode. Um, so Let's see, identify which electrode will be attached to. Yeah, okay, so we're just looking for the, the side of the battery. So positive has to be here to draw those electrons from the anode, and then the negative has to be at this end to force the electrons to the cathode um, for the reduction reactions. Okay, um, there is a video here you can watch on electroplating, so if you want, you can pause the video and watch that now, or you can always come back to it later. Now, the other thing I wanted to do a little bit different with this section, um, just because it's kind of hard to come up with, there's not tons of practice problems available. Um, so what I would like you guys to do is, um, I'm actually going to go over the practice questions, which I normally don't do, um, just so you guys can get kind of some of the thought process of how to work with these types of problems. However, it's definitely in your best interest to pause the video and try them first to see if you can get them right. And then if you can't, you can come back and watch this. Um, if you got them all right, you can probably skip ahead um, to the next part of the video where we look at, I don't know, the next thing. Um, Okay, so restorers of antique cars often refinish chrome-plated parts by electroplating them. The part is attached to one electrode of an electrolytic cell in which the other electrode is lead. The electrolyte um, is a solution of dichromic acid. So the plating of chromium metal will take place at the... Now, if you happen to have like remember this in a test if you have that memorized you'll know that this the object that's trying to be plated is always going to be the cathode and of course we always know the cathode is where reduction occurs so um even if you didn't have that memorized you should be able to always know cathode is reduction and anode is oxidation so b and c are automatically out um but if you weren't sure if you couldn't remember if it was the cathode or the anode that has the plating happening, follow through with the same procedure that you would normally do for any type of cell practice. So you would look at, let's see, we have one electrode is lead, so that's going to be PBS, and then we have the electrolyte solution has H plus as an ion and Cr2O7 um, as as an electrolyte. So um, if we just look at our chart here, we see that solid lead is going to be oxidized to form um, lead ions, whereas um, with the dichromate, we see that it's going to be reduced to form chromium ions. Um, and so basically we can say one electrode is lead, and because lead is being um, oxidized, the other electrode is the part, right? The part is attached to one electrode and then the other electrode is lead. So the part has to be at the other electrode, which would have to be the cathode because um, lead was being oxidized, which is the anode. So now we know that the cathode has to be the proper answer. And of course, we always know that that's where reduction occurs. So that's where we get the answer D from, okay? Um, the next one here, using the same information. So during the operation of this cell, what do we have happening? Well, we just said lead is being oxidized, so that's not right. Um, 
which also means this isn't right. Um, we did look at the, the dichromate is being reduced, so that's not right. The next thing is the pH of the solution increases. Um, so if we look at these two reactions, when we have lead being oxidized, there's nothing in there to indicate anything that would change the pH. However, when we look at our dichromate solution with the 14H plus ions, when that reduction half reaction goes through, we end up with chromium-3 ions and water. So the change that we see here is H plus, which we know contributes to um, acidity of the solution. So we're expecting that on this side of the reaction, we're going to have a lower pH because we have more H plus ions. And after the reaction has, you know, gone through, we end up with water, which is neutral, which is a higher pH, right? So it does make sense that as this reaction proceeds and we use up hydrogen ions and end up with water, we would see an increase in the pH. So this one seems appropriate, but of course, always check all the answers before you come to a conclusion. So the next one is the total energy of the system decreases. Keep in mind um, <clears throat> law of conservation of energy. If you're considering an entire system, you can't have uh, like an increase or a decrease in the total energy, right? Law of conservation of energy. So C would be our most appropriate answer there. Okay, so just keep in mind with this, you can have changes in the energy within the system, but the total energy of the system shouldn't be changing. Okay, next section here is corrosion prevention. So um, again, this is just looking at the same kind of outcomes, basically making sure that you can describe some of the technological applications um, that are used with you know, these concepts that we've been looking at. So corrosion is a problem on a lot of different levels. Um, we've all seen corrosion happening, right? Corrosion is basically rusting, um, or at least that's how we commonly think of it. So how is corrosion related to um, electrochemistry? Well, corrosion is actually a spontaneous redox reaction. Spontaneous redox reaction. Um, of materials with substances in their environment. So lots of metals are strong reducing agents, right? If we look through here, we know like lead, tin, nickel, cobalt, cadmium, all of these solid metals are reducing agents and some of them are quite strong reducing agents. So that means that they'll spontaneously react with oxygen and water, which act as strong oxidizing agents. So if you look in your chart here, fairly high up the chart here, we have oxygen and water together. And and we know that that's, you know, in, in the air all around us all the time. And so any of these lower metals that are exposed to that could potentially have this kind of a reaction um, where they are reduced, right? So if, if um, or sorry, where they're oxidized. So if we have these, where was that? If we have this um, reduction half reaction, then some of these lower metals can have the reduction half reaction where the solid metal breaks down and we see these ions being formed. When those ions are formed, they can react with other substances to form oxides, which is um, basically where rust is. So here you can see kind of a picture of that happening. Um, we have the oxidation half reaction of oxygen and water here. And then on this, we have something that's made out of iron. So we see iron being reduced to iron two plus ions, and then that can react with various things in the air to form rust. Okay. <clears throat> so obviously those ions we know are gonna be reactive and that's where we see the formation of rust. So illustrate the rusting of iron using electrochemistry. As electrons, electrons leave the anode, which is iron, the iron breaks down and rusts. So first we list all the species present. So we have solid iron, um, and then we have oxygen in the air, and we have liquid water in air. Um, so looking at our half reactions, the oxidation half reaction is going to be um, where we have iron, so Fe solid, going to make Fe2+, plus, so those aqueous ions and two electrons. And then for our reduction half reaction, we're going to have oxygen gas plus two liquid waters going to form 
Oh, whoops, sorry, plus four electrons. I almost forgot that. Plus four electrons. And then those are going to go to make four OH minus. So four hydroxide ions. Okay, and then now if we want to have our net redox reaction, we need to balance out our electrons by multiplying this by two so that we have four as well. And so our net redox is going to be two solid irons plus our oxygen gas plus two liquid water molecules. <clears throat> our electrons will cancel out and we're left with um, two iron two plus ions. And four hydroxide ions. Okay, that's everything. Um, explain these results in terms of rusting. Um, so I won't make you guys sit and write it all out, but basically what we would have happening here is solid iron is reacting with oxygen gas and liquid water that are in the air, and this produces iron ions, which are then reactive and can form um, oxides, which is what rust is. So rust is basically Fe2O3. So we can have various reactions happening that are going to make um, rust happen there. Okay, corrosion prevention. Um, this is one of the few things in Chem 30 that unfortunately you do just have to have kind of memorized. Um, you can't really just, although, I mean, probably if you've noticed things at all in your surroundings, you can just rely on a little bit of thinking to figure this out. Um, but there's definitely questions that I've seen on diplomas. We'll look at some in a few minutes where you do have to know some of these different methods. So it is a good idea to, to kind of keep them in your mind. Several ways to prevent corrosion. So the first one is really nice and easy and obvious is apply a protective co coating. So basically we want to make a barrier between the air that causes um, corrosion and the metal that can be corroded. So this can be painting, this can be enamel, um, sometimes for like moving parts, especially oils and greases can help with that. Um, they also help with like the motion, but they also coat um, the actual metal so that it's not as susceptible to corrosion. Now, one important thing to be aware of is this is only effective if the entire metal surface is covered. So you might know this from vehicles, like if you've been in an accident and you have a little scratch, um, that area is going to be susceptible to rusting, right? Because it'll be exposed to the air. So only if the whole metal surface is covered is this going to be very effective. <clears throat> The other thing is to coat with another metal. So we've kind of looked a little bit at this with electroplating already. Um, basically, iron is a very common one that we do this with. So, um, or steel, you might see steel as well, but steel is an alloy of iron and, or of, uh, yeah, of iron and carbon, I believe. So iron can be coated with another tough metal. Um, some of the metals that are commonly used would be zinc. Zinc is, so if you look at zinc here um, on the chart, where is it now? Right, so zinc is down here. So it is still um, as, like lower on the chart here than the oxygen and water. So you might wonder why that would be appropriate. What actually happens with certain metals um, is that they do oxidize, but when they oxidize, they basically form almost like a protective layer because the like the oxidized layer ends up being like resistant to further reactions. And so they form this thin layer as they initially oxidize, but once that layer is formed, they don't oxidize further. And so um, that actually makes them quite strong and resistant to um, you know, further oxidation. So that can be a good useful thing. So zinc is one of those substances. It reacts with oxygen and produces a tough coating that does not flake. So one thing to also be aware of in terms of vocab, whenever you see the word galvanizing, it's always referring to zinc. And you do want to be aware of that because if they ask you, you know, if a question just mentions 
mentions galvanizing and you need to figure out some kind of a chemical reaction, you do need to know that you need to look for that zinc reaction um, on your table. The other thing is chrome can be deposited on an object that's attached to the cathode of an electrolytic cell. And so this is where we're doing something called chroming. This one is probably a little easier to remember what's going on there. Um, so basically we have chrome being deposited on the object. Aluminum and tin are also um, good metals that can form coatings. So for example, like if you've had aluminum cans, right, you know that you don't see anything that seems like rust on it, but actually all of them do have this um, coating of oxidized aluminum, for example, that just doesn't break down any further after the coat is formed of the oxidized aluminum. Um, another thing we have here is to use something called a sacrificial anode. Again, this is definitely a very testable question, so make sure you are aware of this. Um, so a sacrificial anode, which sometimes is called cathodic protection, because basically the cathode is the material that you want to protect, that you don't want to have um, being oxidized. So you have this thing called a sacrificial anode, which is where you attach another electrode to the material that you want to protect. And it is more likely to be oxidized, so it's a stronger reducing agent. And that means that it will be um, oxidized instead of the, you know, the object you're trying to protect. Um, so it's called sacrificial anode because it slowly corrodes, it's destroyed due to oxidation in order to save, um, usually this is for iron objects. So the sacrificial anode shrinks and eventually disappears, so it does need to be replaced. It loses its electrons to ion, to iron as it's oxidized, which discourages the oxidation of the iron. Um, common substances are zinc or magnesium. So here you can see again, we have iron here. So if you're looking for a sacrificial anode, remember you always have to choose a stronger reducing agent. And like I said, this is a really common question. So make sure you're familiar. If you're working with iron, you're gonna wanna choose a common coating that is lower than this. The most common ones are gonna be zinc, magnesium, um, sometimes aluminum could be used as well, um, but those are kind of the common choices. So it is also a good idea not just to remember it needs to be lower, but to have an idea of some of the more commonly one um, used compounds, right? So maybe not choosing like potassium would not be a good choice, okay? Making sure you're choosing kind of more common metals. Um, let's see, last one here is impressed current. Honestly, I haven't seen a lot of information about these ones in tests or diplomas, um, but just kind of be aware. So basically what you have is an electric current is forced to flow towards an object by an external power source. So this sounds very familiar, right, with electrolytic cells. And the power source is basically reversing the flow of electrons so that um, the cathode, which is what you're trying to protect, is is not oxidized, right? Because it's the cathode now, so it's becoming reduced. So essentially what we have is a movement of electrons that is forced through onto this structure that's trying to be protected. And with that movement of electrons onto there, it's not going to be oxidized, okay? I'd say that's the most kind of detail you need to know about that. And just make sure you're kind of aware of the name of that, the impressed current. So just like with the previous questions, I will go through some of these practice questions again because we didn't really, I, it's hard to find examples. So I've mostly made these practice ones. A lot of this you probably could go through and figure out already on your own. So again, my best recommendation for you to learn this material the best would be to try to go to these practice problems. And if you can't get any of them, come back and watch this video so you can kind of see how to think about these questions. Now, if you're, going to go through this and you finish it fine, um, then you don't need to come back and watch this section. So this is the end of today's notes. So at the end of it, just make sure you go in and try some of these practice problems. There's um, some practice problems in the textbook as well as in one of the workbooks that I have posted. And the other important thing is that you have a little bit of reading to do, which I don't normally assign extra reading, but just to make sure that you really understand some of these technological applications, I've assigned that um, for this section. So do make sure you pay attention to that. And next time we will be looking at stoichiometry of cell 
reactions, which is our last section of chapter 14. So I will see you in that lesson if you don't need to come back and review these practice problems. Okay. So for the practice problems, sacrificial metals may be used to protect pipelines, septic tanks, ship propellers. A metal that could be used as a sacrificial anode to protect iron is, and we kind of just went over this, so it should be pretty straightforward. Basically, you would just look for iron and you need to look for a stronger reducing agent always for the sacrificial anode. So we see magnesium down here. So that seems appropriate. Tin, lead, and silver are the other options. And so you can actually see here, tin, lead, and silver. So you know that, <clears throat> and this is actually, <coughs> excuse me guys, um, this is actually a good technique for testing as well, is usually you can kind of tell for questions like this, they're kind of easy questions because one of them is the odd one out, right? You have iron, only one of the substances listed is below it and three are above. So that can also just kind of help you to remember like, what you're looking for. So magnesium would be our choice for that one. Um, next one, one reason that copper pipes rather than iron pipes are used in household plumbing is that iron has a greater tendency to be oxidized than copper. So if we look on our table here, iron is here, copper is here. That means um, Iron has, sorry, what was the question? Iron has a greater tendency to be oxidized. Yeah, so iron is the stronger reducing agent, which means that it's going to be more likely to have the oxidation reaction happen than copper. So that seems good. But like I always tell you guys, make sure you check all the other possibilities. Iron will react with dissolved minerals such as calcium salts. So if we look here, we have iron here would be our oxidation half reaction and it's talking about calcium salts so we don't know what the other like the negative ions would be in the calcium salt but if we look for calcium we see that it's listed here which means it's an oxidizing agent and that's going to be our reduction half reaction and because our reduction half reaction is lower than our iron oxidation it's not going to be a spontaneous reaction so that's not correct copper is a better conductor of heat energy than iron. Um, this one we don't really have the information from for any of our from any of our units so far. So I would usually in this one if you have one that you're that you know is right and one that you're not sure that's always the one you should cancel out. Um, we don't have any information to to let us answer that appropriately. So I'd cancel that one out. Last one, commercial drain cleaners containing sodium hydroxide will react with iron. So again, we have iron here, sodium hydroxide. If you look through the chart, you're not gonna find hydroxide on its own. Um, however, we do have this sodium here. And again, it's going to be um, an oxidizing agent that is lower than iron as a reducing agent. So a non-spontaneous reaction. And so that one is also not correct. So A would be the proper answer there. Um, okay, corrosion prevention three, to protect an underground iron gasoline storage tank, a sacrificial anode of magnesium is attached. Which statement explains how this attachment prevents the iron tank from corroding? So basically we have iron here and we don't want it to be um, oxidized, right? And then our sacrificial anode is magnesium. So basically, because we don't want this one to be oxidized, we do want this one to be oxidized. So the magnesium is what we want to have oxidized. And so in that reaction, we would have magnesium is being oxidized because it's losing electrons, right? Electrons are in the product. So that would be C, the magnesium loses electrons and is oxidized. Okay. So whenever you're looking for sacrificial anode, you're just always looking for the stronger reducing agent. And then just keeping in mind that it should be doing the same reaction that we don't want the, the item we're trying to protect to, to undergo. Um, a galvanized nail. So again, galvanized, what does that mean? It means it's coated in zinc, was placed in a copper two sulfate solution. 
After a day, the blue color of the solution disappeared and copper metal was produced. So remember, we've looked at this reaction before. When you see that blue color coming out of solution, you can always check your color, um, like solution color chart in your book, but blue color disappears, right? So blue color is associated with copper ions. And when it's disappearing and we see copper metal being produced, we know that the copper is being pulled out of solution um, to be made into solid copper. The procedure was repeated with objects made of other metals. Similar results would not be predicted for which of the following. So basically what we want to look at is think about what is this first reaction that we're looking at. So we have um, copper 2 plus is going to make solid copper. Um, we have sulfate ions, but I'm not going to worry about those because those are generally spectators. So in this case, um, this reaction was able to proceed. Let's see, where do we have that? I think it's up here. So that is our oxidation reaction. And if you look at what's happening, because we know that it was a zinc nail that was being coated. So zinc is down here, right? So we have... Um, the reduction half reaction here is higher than our oxidation half reaction down here, which is why the reaction proceeds. So the next thing we need to do is go through and see for all of these items, would they work? So if we have uncoated iron, so basically we have um, Yeah, iron is right here, which is lower. And so that would be the same kind of a reaction that we saw happening with the zinc. And so that means that same reaction would happen, okay? Because we're looking for similar, similar results would not be predicted for which one of these things. So we see the same relationship between this reaction and iron as we did for this reaction in zinc. So A would not be appropriate. Next one, gold plated bracelet. So basically we're looking for gold in relation to copper. So here again is our copper. Gold is located up here. So if this is going to be our reduction half reaction and our oxidation would be this gold up here, um, with that being higher on the chart, we would not expect that reaction to happen. But let's keep going through. Well, sorry, that might be confusing. I mean, the reaction wouldn't happen, but I think that this would be an appropriate answer. So maybe that's the better way to write it. Um, but let's check the rest. So a chromium plated spoon. So again, we have copper here and chromium is down here. So again, we expect that to be spontaneous. So that one would not be right. And nickel, we see the same thing happening. So nickel is down here and copper is up here. So again, we can cross that one off and be left with B as our most appropriate answer. <clears throat> Some car manufacturers have designed an anti-corrosion system that sends a weak electric current from the battery to the frame of the car. The current provides a source of electrons, which reduces corrosion of the steel form. So this is kind of like that um, impressed current. Which of the following methods could not be used as an alternative to the method of corrosion prevention described above? So the first one is galvanized steel frame with zinc. Now, one thing you guys should keep in mind as you move forward with these types of questions is to know that steel, when you're working with steel, basically you're looking at iron. So galvanize the steel frame with zinc. So if we have steel here, um, and we have zinc down here. That's a stronger reducing agent, which means it's going to be oxidized in place of iron. So coating it is appropriate. Coat the steel frame with inert plastic polymers. This is the same as like painting, coating with any kind of inert substance, right? So whether that's paint or enamel or grease, um, we did learn that that was appropriate. Use a paint that prevents contact of the steel frame with the environment. Yep, we talked about that one. Bolt sacrificial anodes made of copper to the steel frame. So if we look at that, our steel frame, iron, and copper.
copper as a sacrificial anode would not work because it's higher on the chart, right? It's a weaker reducing agent than iron, so it would not be a sacrificial anode. So D is not appropriate for that one. <clears throat> um, in order to prevent corrosion, a sacrificial anode is connected to an underground propane tank made of iron metal. Which of the following metals could not function as sacrificial anode? So remember that's going to be any reducing agent that is not lower on the chart than iron. Um, so here we have iron and copper is up here. For the rest, always double check. Chromium is down here, aluminum is down there, and magnesium is down there. So those are all lower than iron, so they are all appropriate. Copper is not. Last practice, um, we have ethene produced um, from ethane, found in natural gas, blah, blah, blah. The buried iron pipeline is subject to corrosion. And guys, I'm not implying you should skip through questions like that, but I'm just trying to save time on the video. Um, so the buried iron pipeline is subject to corrosion because of the trapped air and damp soil, right? So we, we discussed how oxygen and water together are the common um, strong oxidizing agents that cause corrosion to happen. Which of the following actions could prevent the corrosion of the pipeline? So using a, cop uh, a pipeline made of copper, so if we look at our table here, our kind of problem here is the um, oxidizing agents of oxygen and water, and we see that copper is still below that, so we would still see a spontaneous reaction happening there even though you know, it wouldn't be as strong as the one with iron, which is way down here. Um, but regardless, that's still probably not a very good choice. Um, using a pipeline made of chromium. Chromium is even a stronger reducing agent than um, iron. So again, not a good choice. Connecting strips of lead to the pipeline at appropriate intervals. So this is basically looking at like um, kind of a sacrificial anode. So for lead, if we connect that, here we have iron. Lead is up here, so it's a weaker reducing agent, which means it's not more likely to be oxidized than iron is, so it's not going to make a good sacrificial anode. Connecting strips of zinc to the pipeline at appropriate levels, or intervals, sorry. Um, iron, we see zinc is a stronger reducing agent than iron, so it would be more likely to be oxidized, which does make it a better um, sacrificial, a good sacrificial anode um, and better at preventing corrosion of the pipeline. So that would be our most appropriate answer. All right, that's everything, guys. I already went over the practice problems that you have to do, so I will see you in our next lesson.